school. Well, it looks like uh, the good good uh, majority of folks are, are logged on here, so we'll, we'll get it kicked off. Uh, as I mentioned, Eric Hoke here with the Civic Design Center, Design Director, uh, and this is our April Urban Design Forum for uh, the month of April, which is one of my favorite months. It's actually transit month here in Nashville. So uh, it, this, this program kind of touches on some of the, the transit um, infrastructure that we have in, in South Nashville. So it, it pairs up nicely with um, kind of the, the theme of the month and, and how we can um, think about land use and development in uh, this area. So uh, without further ado, uh, our topic today is entitled Engineering a Container Campus. Um, and this has uh, been a, a partnership with the Vanderbilt Engineering students and um, Barge as, as it served as a mentor uh, organization on this. So uh, briefly, I'll tell you a, a, a little story here about Nashville. Um, and starting in, in the 90s, the, it wasn't quite known as the bustling honky tonk Mecca that it is today. Uh, the area south of Broadway or uh, Sobro it is, as it is called um, today, didn't really have like a whole lot going on. Um, so some thought that planning a highway through this community seemed like a good solution to, to fill the area. Uh, however, a group of civic advocates, uh, activists, architects, and community leaders sort of uh, band together to, to halt this construction. Uh, highways in Nashville have been uh, synonymous with destroying neighborhoods, uh, such as the Jefferson Street Corridor and I-40 through, through it um, in North Nashville. Um, so this group of, of civic advocates formed the uh, Urban Design Forum, which uh, goal is to bring debate about development in our city. Um, the group of leaders that, that kind of led to the, um, that stopped the, the interstate construction through the Sobro neighborhood um, it was basically for, formalized the Civic Design Center and helped to create this vision uh, for an urban boulevard here instead of this kind of interstate infrastructure um, and, and uh, continued to lead uh, public debate through that monthly program uh, or what is now a monthly program, the Urban Design Forum. Um, and, and its goal is dedicated to setting standards for community involvement um, so that our spaces reflect people, history and culture. Um, the Civic Design Center's mission uh, is to advocate for civic design visions and actionable change in our communities to improve quality of life for all. Uh, we live out this uh, mission through these four uh, focus areas, which help people become more involved and aware about public debates happening in our communities. Um, we, as well, alongside the Urban Design Forum, the Civic Design Center offers um, many great events. Um, specifically, I'd like to highlight the Civic Advocates Program, which is kind of a, a young urbanist uh, group that, that focuses, that talks, has discussion um, bi-monthly right now and, and on Zoom currently uh, about these sort of topics and a little more involved where we dive in, have a speaker, but it's a really great program for kind of young professionals to get involved. Um, so uh, these, these are kind of the programs that guide our mission. And so this, this focuses on education and advocacy of our organization. Um, we are now celebrating our 20th year as an organization, uh, the Civic Design Center. So this is just some of the impact by the numbers that we've made uh, over the course of our existence. Um, and so we couldn't do the work we do without our uh, sponsors. So special thanks to Amazon, uh, Global Furniture, and Mars Pet Care. Um, so we'd love you to, to get more involved with the Civic Design Center and uh, become a member to get complimentary admission to uh, all of most of our events and uh, Civic Design Center or Urban Design Forum and, and other fun programs. Um, so I, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Lori Troxel, who's been the, the, um, the, the professor for this class specifically, and if she could just uh, give us a quick little uh, intro for, for the class. Yeah, thank you, Eric. 
Um, yes, I am on the Faculty of Civil Engineering at Vanderbilt University, and I oversee the Senior Design Projects. These are year-long capstone um, design courses, so they have to have a design related to what the students have been learning in their four-year uh, curriculum. And um, sometimes they're interdisciplinary, as the one is today. So the one today involves civil engineers and mechanical engineering students. And we are just so grateful to work with Civic Design Center over the past four years. We've had some really great projects, such as capping the interstate downtown, where the students designed a basically a park-like area that went over the interstate at I-65 um, and just made that area a lot more livable, walkable, that led to a better quality of life. Um, they also looked at redesigning Spaghetti Junction, which is where Ellington Parkway meets I-65 and um, also design some infill housing over the WeGo bus station. So for people that um, are mobility challenged or do not have uh, a vehicle of their own, wouldn't it be great if they could live right over the bus center and easily use a bus system? So we thank Civic Design Center for giving students those opportunities as well as the opportunity this year. Um, they've really helped our, connect our students to the city of Nashville. So Sometimes it's easy to get in a bubble at school. And so it's really helped our students understand the city better. And they and Civic Design Center has also connected our students with local engineering companies. And in particular, I'd like to thank Barge Design Solutions. They have um, provided a lot of mentorship for our students. So I look forward to the future with Civil, Civic Design Center. And uh, I, this has been a great partnership and uh, I know it will continue to be one. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Mary with Barge Design Solution. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Mary Fabra. I'm a planner landscape architect with Barge Design Solutions. And uh, we've had the privilege of being part of this program for the past three years. Um, just wanna thank Dr. Troxel and the Civic Design Center for asking us to participate. Um, this year has been uni unique given that we weren't able to meet in person with the students. And also they have a much larger team than before um, focusing on civil, mechanical. Also, they looked at uh, structural uh, engineering uh, aspects as well as urban planning. So you can see from the list on the screen, um, our mentors have been involved with this uh, process. So myself, uh, Steve Edwards, uh, Kevin Smith, Drew Hardison, and uh, Jeff Kunda. Also wanna thank um, Walker uh, Matthews Jr. with RC Matthews who helped with some construction questions. So we appreciate his time as well. And um, just, you know, it's been great working with the students this year. They've been self-motivated and a really impressive group. And I look forward to hearing their presentation today. So with that, I will turn it over to the students. Hi, um, my name is Julia Fenfrock. I am a senior civil engineer and I was working on the construction aspect of the project. Hi, I'm Chloe. I'm also a senior civil engineer and I worked with Julia on the construction side of the project. Hi, I'm Terry. I'm also a senior civil engineer and I focus primarily on the structural sides of the project. Hi, my name is Sarah Politiski. I'm also a senior civil engineer um, and I focused kind of on the site layout and then some water aspects as well. Hi, my name is Jeff Sway. I'm a senior mechanical engineer and I was working on energy demand modeling. Hi, my name is Nick Goldreyer. I'm a senior engineer, mechanical engineer, and I was working on the energy production side of the project. Oh uh, yeah, just kind of to start with a little presentation overview for today, we're going to start with kind of what we proposed for this development and then moving on to some presidents so where we took some inspiration from to our location of the site, as well as kind of why we chose shipping containers and then moving into the due diligence, which we started off the project with, and then some typical container units that we followed throughout the project to kind of simplify it down a bit. And then our site layout, kind of what it would look like on the ground. And then moving into some more engineering, heavy engineering aspects, we did the structural design some construction considerations, energy design, materials design, and then kind of just to close it out, some lessons learned from the project. And then just moving on to just big picture, what we proposed for the, for the site, 
Uh, we did a mixed use shipping container development in Wedgwood, Houston, and we'll get into the location a little bit later. Uh, we tried to focus on sustainability and kind of getting Vanderbilt students to explore other parts of Nashville, as Dr. Troxell was mentioning a little bit earlier, um, kind of getting off main campus and experiencing the rest of Nashville. Um, for the mixed uses, we included residential units for graduate students, some retail shops, restaurants and cafes, and some office space for the university as well. Um, and we we're kind of proposing this more as an interim solution before like larger, more typical buildings can come in. And then lastly, this was just like a student proposal for our class. We just wanted to reemphasize that. So as Sarah said, when we were laying up the scope of the project, we knew that we wanted sustainability to be an important factor. So that's why we decided to look into the living community challenge. So this is a sustainability rating system like LEED, which I'm sure you've all heard of before, but it's more difficult to attain. Um, the living community challenge is derived from the living building challenge, but it's made for larger scale projects such as our mixed use development. So the living community challenge has seven pedals, which you can see in the graphic shown on the slide. And we chose to aim for a pedal certification, going for the three pedals of water, energy, and materials. So during the initial months of our project, our team visited a shipping container apartment complex. It's currently under construction in Wedgwood, Houston, called 83 Freight. Um, the superintendent showed us around um, with some typical uh, apartments and gave us some general tips and tricks that he's learned with working with shipping containers. Um, there's also a current shipping container retail and restaurant area right off of Charlotte that has like some popular restaurants and studios called um, One City. So both of these sites kind of showed us that we could do really anything with shipping containers and there's a wide variety of types of buildings that can be built. Um, something that played a significant role in the decisions that we made regarding this design um, was the location of the site. So the history of Nashville is pretty deeply rooted in the Wedgwood Houston area specifically, which is where this site is. Um, it's currently owned by Vanderbilt and it's used as a big storage lot with a one story printing services building uh, on the east side there. Uh, you can also see the close proximity to I-65, um, which kind of separates Wedgwood Houston from the rest of Nashville, um, except for a few connector streets there. So finding a site that was owned by the university led us to choose graduate student housing as a direction and having a site that borders Fort Negley, which you can see to the north there, um, it really allowed us to incorporate some of the history of Wedgwood Houston and of Nashville as a whole into our designs. So the neighborhood of Wedgwood Houston has been the subject of a few studies and reports in the past few years. Um, first, the Metropolitan Planning Department's planning study in 2018 made a lot of really helpful suggestions like open spaces, high walkability, um, connectivity, increasing sidewalks. Uh, it also had a market study that highlighted Wedgwood Houston's really high rate of craft businesses and industrial spaces and a some really low vacancy rates. So that really demonstrated to us the importance of an industrial artistic themed development with a lot of residential space um, and a lot of walkability sidewalks, just like our site. Um, Fort Negley, on the other hand, which is directly north of our site, it's the largest inland stone fortification built during the Civil War, mainly by runaway slaves and free blacks. And um, the area also has a lot of rail lines, which were really important to the country's infrastructure. So the construction of those highways that I was talking about earlier really cut this area off and a, a really vibrant African-American community was kind of isolated on the other side of the interstate. Um, so it's really important that our site like pays homage to Fort Negley and the history of the area, all while improving that connectivity and kind of bringing Wedgwood Houston back into Nashville. So multiple factors influenced our decision to use shipping containers. Um, the first being just the sheer abundance of them in the US. So in 2014, the United States imported 19.6 million TEU and TEU is a unit for measuring cargo capacity. It stands for 20 foot equivalent units. 
uh, but it only exported 11.9 million. So as a result, a lot of shipping containers in the United States are just left in storage. Um, we also felt that the stackable nature of containers uh, would really permit us to lean into modular construction, which is something that we were very interested in. And the containers are designed to be stacked up to eight high during shipping, and they connect vertically at the corners. So we thought that it would just be a very convenient model. In addition, the size of the shipping containers that we're using, they're 40 feet by eight feet, lend themselves to living small, which is both really trendy and sustainable. These containers also just fit with the industrial aesthetic that's found elsewhere in Wichita, Houston. So we thought that was a great match as well. So the first step of our project after we finished the ideation phases was to be in our due diligence. So on this slide, you can see a lot of pictures from when we visited the site um, early in the fall semester. So first of all, as was mentioned before, the site is made up of two specific properties that all encompass the Vanderbilt Printing Services building, which is about 130,000 square feet, a very large parking lot with about 350 spots, as well as a storage area with a lot of items that have been moved from the undergraduate campus over into Wedgwood, Houston. And you can also see in the top left image that there is a retaining wall. So that cued us in that there could be some sort of a grade change on the site because you wouldn't necessarily build a retaining wall for another reason. Um, additionally, we know that we're gonna have to move a lot of these items off of the site when we move forward with construction. So it was important to note what type of items were located there. So moving forward with the due diligence, after we visited the site, we had the opportunity to use the um, Metro Nashville parcel viewer, which you see screenshotted here to find some more specific information. So both of the properties that I mentioned before summed up to about 11.66 acres. So that's the amount of land space we had to work with. Um, additionally, we were able to look into the grading situation that we thought might be relevant. And we found out that there is actually a 26 foot elevation change, which is roughly sloping from the Northwest corner down to the Southeast corner. And over our site, which is almost 12 acres, this grade change isn't necessarily too significant, but it's still something important that we would need to consider. Additionally, we found out that the site is not in the floodplain and there's no known problems with the soils. So that's definitely a positive thing when civil engineers are coming in looking to develop a site. Um, then we also had to look at the zoning. So the community character right now is just an urban mixed use neighborhood, which you might have gotten a sense from what Julia described as what Wedgwood Houston is. Um, however, it is currently zoned as an industrial warehousing and distribution area. So we would likely want to go through a zoning appeal to have it be a mixed use limited district. As we said, we are looking to create a mixed use um, development. So this is probably very interesting to you all because we've talked about a lot of how the project came to be and this is what we would actually want our three um, typical container units to look like. So starting on the far left is our one story unit. So this one is going to be restaurants and cafes as well as residential common spaces. And this is the unit that is accessible to those who might have different mobility needs. So we could also prioritize these units if we needed to turn them into residential units for those who perhaps are not able to go up um, stairs. The middle unit is our two bedroom residential as well as possible retail space. So this one will have a staircase inside and will feature two stories. And on the far right, we have our three story unit. So this is either a three bedroom residential a retail space or an office and research space. And just to note, I know we said this before, but each container is about 40 feet by eight feet. So there's about 320 total square footage within each of these containers. So you can see that moving left to right from the single story to the three story, there is a really large increase in um, square footage for living space. To help visualize what it would look like to actually live inside one of these containers, uh, we created internal renders of the different residential units. So the first image you see and the next one show the internal render of a studio apartment. And then the next one is what the kitchen and dining area of the two bedroom and three bedroom units would look like. 
then the final render you'll see is what a typical bedroom for those larger two bedroom and three bedroom units looks like. Kind of moving on to our site layout, what it would look like big picture. Um, we pulled a lot from the university connections draft from the Civic Design Center, kind of inspire this layout. Um, and then each orange block, block, as you can see in the site legend, is about a sing one single 40 by eight foot container. Um, so moving on to kind of our streets that we proposed, we had a main boulevard running north south connecting into um, Chestnut Street to the north and Fort Negley Court to the south, which are existing streets. Um, and then an east-west cross street, which we'll get into a bit later as well with uh, bike lanes and landscaping and some other elements as well. And then moving on to our different uses. First, we have our residential with one, two and three bedroom apartments, um, again, for graduate students and then some common spaces on the, the corners of those open lawns as well. And this would make up about 60% of the square footage. And then moving on to the retail and dining locations, we have those more lining Chestnut Street kind of to draw people into the site as well as that inner square. And then most of these units are those like six containers stacked on top of each other to really get a lot of square footage out of them. And then lastly, we have our office and research space. We located those on the east side of the property because there is an active rail line, a CSX rail line to the east. Um, so just for some noise concerns, we thought it would be better for the office space to be located there. And then again, those are six containers stacked on top of each other. And then moving on, kind of we had the open lawn spaces kind of similar to Vanderbilt's main campus. And then we also have a multi-use trail on the east side of the property. There's a lot of like big mature existing trees there. Um, so we wanted to protect those with a trail and then something for residents to enjoy as well. And then we have the community garden and compost, which is in, in accordance with the living community challenge for our sustainability goals, um, which we'll, Jeff will get into a bit later. And then we have some plazas on the corners. We didn't go into a lot of details on those, but something to kind of just draw people into the site, especially if you're coming along Chestnut Street, that would be like one of the first things you would see. And then uh, 350 parking spots according to Metro Nashville's um, requirements. And then moving on to more of our transportation. Again, we have that main bullet, uh, main thoroughfare running north-south and then the cross street running east-west. And then we also have sidewalks and crosswalks, which vary in size according to how much they would be used. And then there is an existing bike lane along Fort Negley Boulevard, um, but there's been a few studies like the Wedgwood Houston Chestnut Hill study and University's Connections uh, draft that proposed a new bike lane running along Chestnut Street to kind of increase connectivity over the highway and the rail line especially. Um, so we included that as well. And there's currently two WeGo bus stops on Chestnut Street. So we propose either to relocate one of those more internally to, that, to the site, kind of on that inner square that you can see in the middle or adding a new stop. And then lastly on this slide, there is um, solar overhead on some of the parking spots, which we'll get into later as well. And then moving on to the main boulevard, kind of just to vis visualize what it would look like, we did a street mix diagram. Um, you can see the six containers stacked on top of each other, which was what would occur on that main street. Um, kind of just moving left to right on this, we have the sidewalk and then a lamp and a tree to kind of separate the pedestrian from the biker and then a six foot bike lane and then a planner box to protect the biker from the parking lane and drive lane. And then in the center, we have kind of a landscaped area that could be like a place to hang out. And then it's mirrored on the other side. Overall, this width is about a hundred feet from the edge of one sidewalk to the edge of the other. And then in a similar vein, we have the cross street as well. This is a bit smaller and it's like more inviting scale for the pedestrian. Uh, the, there's only one container on the ground, so a bit lower. And then the difference here would be the center turn lane to kind of access those parking areas in the different quadrants. And then the sidewalks and lanes are about the same width and the bike lanes and planning areas are a bit smaller. Um, lastly, for the site layout, 
we have our graded and drainage. So you can see the existing contours are in red, again, showing that about 25 foot elevation change from the northwest corner to the southeast corner, um, but over about 12 acres. So it helps a bit, not as dramatic as it might seem. And then there's that existing four foot retaining wall that we would likely take out. And kind of to arrive at this diagram, we started with the existing constraints. So the current elevations on the existing streets and kind of worked from there, trying to minimize cut and fill as much as possible and match the existing grading. And there's no more than a 5% slope across the whole site. And then this is kind of our drainage with the rough direction and scale of the water that would be moved um, draining towards that detention pond in the southeast corner. And then moving on to Terry with our structural design. So as Chloe mentioned earlier, we focused on three typical container units, which encompass residential, retail, and dining spaces. So to start off with structural analysis, we use the ASCE 7 minimum design loads for buildings and other structures. And we use this to help us calculate the live and dead loads that are applied to each structure. Um, and then to analyze and design our buildings, we used both LRFD and ASD. So the next few slides are just going to show the calculated live and dead loads that we used for each container type in our design work. So we had to account for wind, seismic, snow, as well as the minimum design live load for the given type of structure, as well as just the dead load of the structures themselves. So this first slide here is for container type one, which is a three bedroom residential unit. And something to note as we click through these is just how the wind and seismic loads change depending on the size of the units. So if we go to the next one. This slide shows the loading calculations for our retail building. And then this third slide here shows the loading calculations for our dining unit. And then moving on to our foundation design, we decided to go with As I mentioned earlier, when stacked, shipping containers are designed to carry their load in the corners and that forms almost a column. Um, and we felt that the square pier footings would capitalize on this design very well. So if you look below, you can see the footing layout for the three different types of containers that we're analyzing. And for each container, the footings that are labeled with the same letter have the same dimensions and reinforcements. And then to provide just a better visual, here are the three footing designs for container two, which is the retail building. As you can see, there are different size footings and reinforcements, and that's based on the load requirements. And then on each footing, you can see a 14 inch square pier. And those are reinforced with number five bars. And the piers are three feet tall, as you can see, with one foot being above ground to keep the building elevated and two feet below grade for freezing and thawing. And then another design choice that we encountered was just deciding how to connect the shipping containers, not only to each other, but also to the foundation. So after conducting some research on existing container buildings, we decided to use welding. So these containers vertically interlock via the corner posts, as I mentioned before, but by welding these corner posts as well as along the edges will provide a much more stable structure. And then to connect the structures to the foundation, we decided to place steel weld plates into the wet concrete piers. And then once the concrete's cured, we can weld those corner posts to the steel plates. So moving forward into the physical construction on our site, um, we decided to use prefabrication and modularization, and we had a few reasons for that. So to begin with, prefabrication is found to be a lot cheaper as well as a lot more time effective than doing work on the site. And we found some academic research saying that prefab could actually be up to 25% cheaper. So that is definitely a lot more cost effective for whoever is gonna be financially supporting the project. Additionally, factory prefabrication work is known to be a lot safer than site work. This is just because it's all taking place indoors, so the workers are safe from the elements or weather event to occur. And additionally, it allows the construction to be happening in sort of a conveyor belt fashion, in a much more organized fashion than scattered across a 12 acre site. And as far as modularization, Terry kind of highlighted the way that these containers come already built with eight um, interlocking corners. So the containers will quite literally be able to snap into each other, kind of like Legos. And then we would just have to come in and do some welding on the site after the containers get delivered. 
So these are our five steps for the construction process. And we will go over how this lines up with a timeline on our schedule a little bit later, but just to begin with an overhead view. So the first step is gonna be acquisition of these containers. So as we mentioned before, we will be using containers that came from overseas and are now sitting in the US, um, probably going to become a waste. So we would acquire those from a port location and we were gonna do this in three separate phases because we were in contact with an expert in container acquisition and he suggested that finding a way to acquire over 600 containers in one go is probably not realistic. So we have three phases. The first phase, we will acquire 211 containers. The second phase will be 216. And the final phase will be another 216 container phase. So then respectively through each phase, we will transport the containers to the prefabrication site. And this will be done um, via a contracted trucking company. Once the containers are at the prefabrication site, um, the prefab cycle will begin. And the goal here for those not familiar is to minimize the on-site cutting and welding. And we are really hoping to be able to prefabricate everything in the containers so that once they get to the site, we really only have to do a few connections and a few finishes on them. So after the containers are done with prefabrication, they then will be transported to our Wedgwood Houston site. Again, um, using a trucking company that we will be partnered with. And then finally, once the containers arrive on the site, we will be stacking them up layer by layer, connecting all the utilities, and that will pretty much be it for completion of these five steps. And sort of the sixth step that we had been thinking about a bit since this is a temporary project is where these containers would go after the project is over and when Vanderbilt wants to come in and perhaps put something else on the site. Um, so we actually found a project here in Nashville called the North Collective, and they offer housing to artists. So that was one possible consideration for somewhere that we could perhaps partner with to give some of these containers to create housing over there, um, just because it would kind of defeat the sustainability goals of our project to only have this site up and running for a few years and then to dispose of the containers. So we're hoping to reuse them and recycle them after this site is repurposed. So you can see our construction schedule here, and I know it's kind of hard to see any real detail um, and it's pretty small, but we just wanted to show you guys the general sequence and the amount of overlapping that's involved um, with a project like this. So the x-axis here shows time with each um, column being a week and each row is a different activity. So after we spoke with some construction and contracting professionals in Nashville, we came up with a 77 week long schedule um, and due to the large number of containers needed, like Chloe said, we're gonna need to split this up into three phases, which you can see here with the different colors, um, phase one in blue, phase two in red, and phase three in yellow. Um, and that'll happen from the get-go um, with the excavations and the foundation work, which this first section up here on the top is overall general site work, foundations, utilities, um, grading, some landscaping and all of that. And the ones that aren't phased out are here in dark gray. And then as you move down along the schedule, we show our phase one containers, um, which is acquisition, transportation, that big long amount of time there is for the prefabrication of the containers, and then moving on to the actual connection of them. Um, you can also see at the end there, we do some landscaping and some outdoor finishes, which you can go to the next slide. So this is a little more detail on our phasing plan. It'll be split into three, starting with residential buildings in the northwest corner of the site, which are shown in blue there. And then we're going to kind of move southeast um, to the office retail and research space. So we wanted to ensure the residents could move in as soon as possible. Um, so it's important to get those apartments built along the north and west sides first, along with some basic amenities like restaurants, common spaces, and some paving for fire and evacuation purposes. Um, because almost every part of the containers are prefabbed off-site, there would be pretty minimal disruption to residents that are already living in these containers when the rest are being brought to the site and connected, especially on the corner of Chestnut and Fort Negley Boulevard. 
on the northwest corner there's a couple in there that are going to need to come in and be built after so it'll really help um, the prefab process will really help eliminate a lot of that um, disruption to residents and then kind of returning back to our sustainability focus with the living community challenge um, to start off we wanted to focus on the water pedal so the requirements from the challenge, there's three. The first one being working in harmony with the natural water flows of the site, which we kind of achieved by matching the existing grading. And then the second one is 100% of the water needs supplied by precipitation or another closed loop system. And then the third requirement is that all stormwater and water discharge be treated and managed on site. Um, since these are like a bit tough to achieve, uh, they do have an exception for potable water where you can connect into the local utility for this site it would be Metro Water Services, um, mainly for like the health aspects for like drinking water and everything related to that. Um, so kind of moving forward, we decided to focus on more of the non potable water use. So we used a district scale reuse calculator. So for the large site. Um, to get the right amount of volumes for to establish the non potable water supply and demand that you can see in this graph. So kind of included in the supply would be gray water from like showers and sinks and washing machines and then black water which this calculator kind of defined a bit differently than usual as they defined it with like the kitchen sink water and dishwasher and then rain and storm water as well. And then for demand of non potable water, it's mainly coming from the landscape irrigation because those um, lawns are quite big. So to reduce this a bit, we could choose like a different type of grass or a different type of landscaping to reduce the water demand. And then overall about 41% of the non potable demand could be met by the supply. And this is pretty comparable to Vanderbilt's main campus, which has about 30 million gallons a year of non potable demand. And then moving on to the mechanical engineers. Yeah, moving on to the living community challenges energy pedal. Um, the LCC requires that all energy be generated on site with renewables. So to determine how to size our energy supply system, we modeled energy demand of our residential units under Nashville weather conditions um, using some Department of Energy software. We assumed all electric buildings since they'll be powered by solar panels on each roof spread and spread across the site. Uh, we focused on minimizing energy usage, but also factored in construction costs um, and examining utility costs based on Nashville electricity services pricing. So to optimize these buildings, the software allowed us to change certain aspects like the insulation type or our window construction. We also found one of the primary ways to reduce um, electricity usage was through this more novel technology known as variable refri refrigerant flow. So this technology uses a reversible heat pump to move heated or cooled refrigerant directly to each conditioned space inside the units. So this eliminates the need for ductwork to move preheated or cooled air around the building. This also helps reduce the amount of equipment we need um, since one system can both heat and cool. Now moving on to some of our energy modeling results. Um, so our simulations show a single unit's electricity usage uh, over the entire year broken down by end use. So that's that bar graph you see on the left. So the number at the top of the graph um, is electricity usage in kilowatt hours. And the left bar shows a benchmark home and the right bar shows the optimized home design. And then there's a black line on that right bar that shows the amount of electricity generated by the solar panels on that unit. So for our studio apartment, we found we could reduce electricity demand by 61%, um, 63% for the two bedroom unit. And then finally, for the three bedroom unit, we found we could reduce electricity demand by 67%. Now looking specifically at that larger unit, um, the solar panels on the roof alone can meet about half of our electricity demand. And it is a more expensive equipment and installation cost, but most of that can be attributed to our rooftop solar panels. So to continue talking about the solar panels, we designed a photovoltaic and battery system to provide power to our development. Um, we quickly realized that because of Nashville's energy rates, and also the falling battery prices that you can see on the right, it is more cost effective to go with the battery solution. 
because uh, to sell back extra energy to the Nashville grid, you only receive about 20% of the price of power um, when you sell it back. So that does not make financial sense. Um, to design our battery system, we used a software called Reot, which optimizes the photovoltaic and battery systems based off of the financials. Um, this came out to be a four, 540 kilowatt solar system, which is about 50,000 square feet of solar. Uh, that would go above the parking spaces and also on the tops of the roofs. Um, and also a 530 kilowatt hour capacity battery system to store the excess energy for later use. To test this battery system, we used another software called the System Advisor Model, um, which gives better uh, output and financial forecasts for our system. Specifically, I wanna draw your attention to the levelized cost of energy, which comes out to be around 9.16 cents per kilowatt hour, um, and also the net present value of the system, which comes out to be around negative $700,000. Uh, this will be important in deciding whether this uh, extra investment is worth the sustainability aspect for the energy. And finally, to begin to address the materials pedal of the Living Community Challenge, um, which demands that all food waste be eliminated on site, we chose to use composting. Um, there's a large range of food waste estimates for um, individuals, but it works out to about a pound of food waste per day um, over the entire year. And the specific composting technology we chose is known as windrow composting. So that involves piling all your food waste into long rows and letting microbes break that down into compost. Uh, forced aeration can help you draw air, which speeds decomposition um, and also reduces the need for equipment to turn over the composting material, which can help save space for the entire site. Now, our final calculations show about 3,600 square feet are needed. So you can see that on our overall site plan. Now, moving on to our final slide, um, I think all of us learned a lot throughout the life of this project. Personally, I learned that there are a variety of oftentimes even unexpected ways to reduce energy demand. Um, I learned that uh, creating a sustainable development can often cost a lot more than doing it the traditional way. Um, so the developers have to make a decision <clears throat> as to whether it's worth it to create a site that's sustainable or not and to what degree. The big thing I learned is just the importance of considering the surrounding areas of project, not only to match the character, but also to limit contributions to gentrification. And especially in a growing city like Nashville, Gentrification is such a huge issue, so developers really need to be cognizant of that. I thought it was really valuable to see the wide range of construction and design professionals that are involved in something like this, whether it be the design of this actual site or just the creation of this student proposal. I thought it was really interesting how this project really differed from the classroom setting because typically we're used to doing assignments where there's always one answer and one solid numerical final result, but in this case, as much guidance as we see, sought out and as much as we spent time with our mentors, we still found that it was extremely creative. It was an extremely creative process and it was really all in our own hands and there was no defined answer, which we are typically used to having as if we work towards it. Yeah, and kind of picking, piggybacking off what Chloe said with like it being a creative process, I feel like I kind of learned how like iterative it can be like returning back to the same thing and trying to get it to be as close as perfect to perfect as possible um, and just putting the best our best foot forward with this project. Um, and that is all we have with our presentation if there's any questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, and I'll just add, like, I had a great time being a mentor on this project for the Civic Design Center uh, over the semesters here. And uh, I think Mary might feel the same way. Um, but so, yeah, I just wanted, <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead, Mary. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to agree with you. Absolutely. It's been a great experience. Thank you. But really impressive work by the students. Yeah.
Uh, so I just wanted to add like a few footnotes on this. So the University Connections draft document that Sarah uh, mentioned, we haven't actually put that out anywhere, but we will be releasing it in the upcoming week here. So stay tuned uh, to Civic Design Center to, to follow up on that. And then uh, as well as the bike lanes that were mentioned, I just wanted to add that it's also in the walk and bike plan. Uh, so that's a government um, sanctioned suggestion as well. So I'll add that to the mix. Um, so I, 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 I'm seeing a few questions uh, coming through here. So um, maybe let's see. Well, first off, I, I think we, we talked a lot about this, Jeff, I think a, a little while back, but like insulation, this is just a thought I had during your presentation. Uh, I was trying to think back to that specific conversation about insulation uh, in containers specifically and how that could help with uh, energy efficiency and that sort of stuff. And then I'll look at the, the questions out here if you wanna get, take a shot at answering that. Yeah, one of the big challenges of using these shipping containers is that there isn't a lot of space for insulation. So I think they're for, the external dimensions are like 40 feet long, eight feet wide uh, and nine foot six high. So one nice aspect of how the shipping containers are nested, there's a little bit of space in between them. So you can put insulation in there. And then one just huge focus was finding an insulation with a really high R value. So it has a great insulating capability given a really um, short linear distance. So that turned us on to closed cell spray foam, um, which is a kind of a more novel technology versus like the fiberglass batting you probably have in your house. So that you can just spray that into closed spaces and it'll give you great insulating properties. Excellent, yeah, uh, that's great. And yeah, I, I know that's, that was, we had a, a little dialogue about that. It was probably a while ago, but I'm glad you gave it some thought. Um, so we have another question and might be a similar uh, answer with insulation, but maybe you all found other strategies. Uh, thinking about the railroad, as was mentioned, there's kind of that green buffer on your site plan there. Uh, but any other kind of like noise mitigation efforts that you all came up with for, in, in relation to the railroad specifically? I think um, keeping those existing trees there would help a bit. And then kind of just putting the office space rather than the residential there so that like the noise levels aren't impacting like say someone's sleep or um, just having it more during the day when there's less use on the site. Um, but no like exact considerations for like a noise abatement wall, but that could definitely be possible as well. Great. Um, and so this, I, I'm not sure, did we, how many total units or residents could be housed within the design that you proposed? I think it was about 209 residents. And then um, quite a bit more for um, retail and residential as well. I don't have the exact number. I can pull it up though. Right. Well, that was that was just one of the questions here. I'm just kind of scrolling through. Uh, did you design the containers themselves for structural integ integrity when adding openings, windows, doors, that kind of stuff? Like I, we often hear about the um, you know when you start cutting a container it poses structural challenge. So any thought on that? Yeah, so um, what we did for just based on looking at other existing container buildings, when you make a cut in the wall, as you said, it does decrease the structural integrity. So to combat that, we have wood framing um, with a column in the middle and that gets, you can't see it on the inside because of insulation, like it gets covered in the wall. But yes, when there's a cut in the container, it needs to have some support to allow it to maintain the same level of structural integrity that it had before. That's great. Yeah. So sorry, I'm just trying to catch up on all these questions. Um, yeah, the wa the walking trail that that came up in the chat here. Um, and like, the, I think there might have been a few even proposed throughout the design here. So do you want to talk about how the maybe even like the multimodal design altogether kind of comes together on the site? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, we wanted to like protect those trees again. 
because um, they are quite large. So I think Mary suggested to us actually to put like a trail through there and that would be that would be a benefit to the residents and even to any visitors. Um, so like a walking trail primarily. And then for the multimodal part, we do we did suggest adding those bike lanes again along Chestnut Street, like Eric was mentioning before, and then along the two main streets as well, so that residents could easily connect into the existing infrastructure as well. And then there are the two existing bus stops as well on Chestnut Street right now. And then so either adding a stop that might be a little closer or encouraging residents to go ahead and use those stops that are already existing on Chestnut. Great. Um, have you considered differential settlement in your footing design? Um, honestly, no, I did not put that into consideration um, when I was speaking with Steve about the footing design, but if that, maybe that's something that I should look into further. All right, and uh, expansion joints, joints due to heat. That was another question, but probably in, in that same realm. Maybe that's, uh, as opposed to maybe like welding or other, th or in addition to? Yeah, I, I think just based on a lot of the sources we found online, the most popular way to connect them was simply through welding. Um, I think that potentially the way that they are designed to stack might already like take that into consideration because based on all of the designs that we saw when we were looking through our resources, uh, the really at the forefront was just welding them together. Yeah. Um, okay, so you've acknowledged that pursuing a more sustainable design often comes at a greater cost than traditional or familiar solutions. Uh, what do you see as the role of design team in helping to advocate for more sustainable design solutions when the upfront cost might be a turnoff for developers? Do you have thoughts on that? Well, I can take that one. Um, <clears throat> I think it kind of depends on the situation. Um, often sustainable design can have a lower life cycle cost because of lower energy inputs um or you know lower maintenance you know a variety of reasons um lower water usage like we we're doing with our our water um treatment system um but then it also depends on your stakeholders um for instance vanderbilt might be more willing to make a larger investment towards sustainability um in order to kind of set a precedent of uh, more developed technologies and, and that kind of thing but some other developers, you know, might just have a solid bottom line that they um, can't move. So I think it's up to the um, designers to work with the developers in seeing how um, how sustainable they can make it, and maybe using working within their budget to um, do as much as they can in that respect. Great. Um, it looks like Sarah had a follow up um, 89 residential units, eight restaurants, 16 retail units, 24 uh, research slash office. Um, and so I think, and some of those, I think there was also a second part to the Greenway question, I think about uh, maybe more that uh, like retail office research, that stuff, addressing those uh, more like Greenway kind of elements. So, and, and were those positioned? Um, towards that side? Yes, they were. So like the, when it's like one container that would be facing the trail and then kind of stacking up and then reverse on the opposite side as well. Great. Um, okay, are there any roles that would have helped answer questions and develop these designs further? What do you think would have changed if landscape architects uh, were on this team? I can take that one. Um, as far as landscape architects go, I can say that definitely with our site design, as far as like the lawns and just leaving those trees there, we didn't necessarily go any further than that. Um, 
we had discussed in like the early stages of the project, possibly putting in like some native landscaping. Um, and obviously if this project were to come to fruition, there couldn't just be bit large empty lawns and a single line of trees. Um, but at the same time, I think we didn't necessarily see um, landscape architecture as being a major priority considering this project was more so meant to be aligned with the engineering side of things. So I think that ha if we had landscape architects that probably would have made the project a brought it a little bit closer to like fruition and to what it could have actually been in the real world. Um, so yeah, I, and I, I should add that it was also architecture, architects and landscape architects too. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, architects in general, I think that due to the fact that the containers kind of come pre-made with those shapes, it's, there's not too, too much wiggle room with designing anything um, too unique. Um, we had discussed putting some permanent buildings on the site and also doing um, the other half being containers and we ended up moving away from that. But maybe if we had architects involved, they would see some benefit in putting actual structures on the site as opposed to doing 100% um containers so i think those two roles could have brought maybe some more perspectives um to the design that could have helped if we were to move forward with this um towards actual construction yeah and i think the uh it's it's an interesting proposal as it's a phased kind of approach anyway so yeah it's it's almost like a temporary um feeling um so yeah uh, another another question here i guess kind of a follow-up but um so Gary, our, our CEO was impressed with, with the uh, planning decisions you all made for the site um, for not being planning students yourselves. Uh, curious how you enjoyed this new aspect of the thought process and going into design and planning uh, experiences. Yeah, they definitely got out of their comfort zone, <laughs> right? Right, Eric? Yes. I'll say I really enjoyed the break from our, like Chloe was saying earlier in our presentation, we really always do problems and have these projects that have one right answer. And I really enjoyed getting to see the fact that like there are so many individual decisions that can be made on a site like this. Um, and obviously there's a lot of factors that go into why you would make those decisions. But in the end, it really was up to us to design this and to come up with the schedule. So it was, it was nice to be able to have a little bit more of like a realistic spin on a lot of the things that we normally do in our coursework. Um, so it was a, it was a great experience for me. Awesome. Well, uh, we are almost at time, but maybe we can squeeze one more question in here just, just for the sake of it. Uh, Cause the last one I think on our list, so let's get to it. Uh, but you know, if you were to live in these developments, what do you think the best slash worst part of it would be? And like, you know, would you, like a graduate, would a graduate student like to live here? What do you, do you think? I can start that one off. I think like the location of the site is absolutely everything. For those of you who are in Nashville, Wedgwood Houston is like an awesome area. We talked about how there's a lot of like, um, there's like breweries, there's a lot of small shops and businesses. Um, the undergraduate campus is definitely in an area that is like more typical. Um, there's a lot of like chain businesses and there's not necessarily too much like cultural character to the area. But if you drive out to Wedgwood, Houston, it's probably like 10 or 15 minutes away from where the undergraduate campus is. It's pretty much like a whole different feeling. And I know that a lot of graduate students live in random locations spread out across Nashville. And I think if they could find like a small community in Wedgwood, Houston, they would definitely not be like right with undergraduate students, which I don't necessarily think like a 24, 25 year old would want, but they would also be in a really, really cool, what I see as up and coming part of Nashville. And I think it's a great place to be located. So I think they could possibly really enjoy that. Excellent. Um, Mary, Lori, any closing thoughts here? I just want to say great job to all the students. I'm so proud of you. And um, thank you to everyone that watched. It was really fun to see the response to this project. Yes, thank you. Great job. Enjoyed being a part of it.
All right. Well, thanks to thanks to all our uh, all the mentors who were involved. I, I think some of you are on the call as well from Barge side, uh, and and thanks obviously to Vanderbilt. Uh, this we've loved this partnership with the engineers over the last few projects. We've had some great outcomes, and I think this adds just to the the portfolio here. So it's it's going to be really cool. We'll have more information about this project specifically on the Civic Design Center website coming. Uh, hopefully in, in coordination with all that um, University Connections uh, blog post. So stay tuned on that stuff. Uh, but yeah, we'd love you to, to become a member of the Design Center and we hope that you'll uh, get involved, especially if you're uh, maybe one of the students uh, watching, if you want to join the Civic Advocates uh, program, it's really fun and involved and a great way to talk about all these topics that we continue to do. So. Uh, yeah, our, our spring uh, event featuring Anthony Fox, former uh, transportation secretary under Obama, is going to be speaking at our May Urban Design Forum. So we're really excited about this one and hope you all can join us uh, Thursday, May 6th in the morning. So um, yeah, that's that's all we have today. Uh, thanks everyone for, for joining us on the call. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you all um, hopefully beyond Zoom as well. So thanks everyone, see ya.